Hello, welcome to our visit with Crown Point Press in San Francisco. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. This program is one of a series of six visits we're making to some of the fine art print publishers of the IFPDA as part of our Print Month programming. Print Month is held each year in conjunction with the IFPDA Fine Art Print Fair, which is currently online with Artsy. Next Thursday, we travel to Madison, Wisconsin for a visit with Paula Penchenko and the Master Printers at Tandem Press. On the final Saturday of the month, we visit with Ann Marshall and the Master Printers at Durham Press in Pennsylvania. Today, we're in San Francisco with Crown Point Press, whose galleries you're seeing as we walk to find Valerie Wade, the director of Crown Point Press. And I'm going to be uncharacteristically quiet for a moment so that you can enjoy the silence of their beautiful space. One note as we uh, get close to Valerie is that the Q&A is open throughout the program. If you have a question for Valerie or any of the folks in the studio, please type it into the Q&A box and we will get to as many as time allows throughout the program. Welcome, I'm Valerie Wade. We're so happy to share our space with you today. I'm your tour guide for this morning, afternoon, and we're going to be having a quick walk through of the exhibition, look at the new Allison Shops prints, head through the showrooms into our back area space and into the studio where Courtney Sinish, our master printer, will show you how to make shin collé and how to hand write the plate. So this exhibition is called 3D to 2D. It's a group of uh, artists that all make prints but who are primarily sculptors. For those of you that don't know Crown Point Press, I'm going to give you a quick introduction. It would take me a whole hour to really do justice to our long story. But just to fill you in with some of the highlights, we are celebrating our 58th year in 2020. Crown Point Press was founded in 19. 1962 by Catherine Brown, and it focuses on artist etchings produced in San Francisco or on woodcuts that were produced in Japan from 1982 to 1989. We also did prints in China in the late 80s for about three years. Press has two websites, crownpoint.com, which was developed in 1998, emphasizes its published prints, and magicalsecrets.com presents practical information for printmakers and shows videos of artists working in the studio. Catherine Brown has always made films of the artists working, of course, with their permission. The first artist she worked with filming was John Cage, and that was in 1978. She continues to make these videos to this day, and Catherine comes in to the press every day to work. Crown Point holds summer workshops every summer for four weeks, unfortunately not this year and has a store online and on site that sells books, supplies, and tools. Art historian Susan Tallman in her book from 1996, The Contemporary Print, describes Crown Point Press as the most instrumental American print shop in the revival of etching as a medium of serious art. The press celebrated its 25th anniversary in 1987 with an exhibition at MoMA in New York. And in 1997, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and the National Gallery of Art each acquired an ongoing archive of our prints. In 2012, as Crown Point turned 50, the National Gallery held an exhibition titled, Yes, No, Maybe, Artist Working at Crown Point Press. Richard Diedenkorn, Saul Witt, and John Cage are three artists who during their lifetimes work frequently at Crown Point. They had a strong influence on how the printers approach their work with the artists. Wayne Tebow, who you just saw in the other room, is equally influential. His project at Crown Point, his first project was in 1964. Most recently, he worked here in 2019. 
and next month he turns 100. During our long history, we have worked with over 110 artists. Between 1977 and 2020, Crown Point has produced and published fine art prints by Toma Apps, Darren Gorman, Anna Anderson, Ann Appleby, Chris Burden, John Chiara, Leonardo Drew, Marcel Zama, Mary Heilman, Jacqueline Humphreys, Tom Marioni, Julie Meritu, Yoko Nordstrom, Chris O'Feely, Gay Outlaw, Laura Owens, Edward Shea, Shazia Sikander, Patricia Tribe, Charlene Van Heil, Mary Weatherford, and John Sarrier. I wanted to special mention that Robert Bechtel, who worked regularly at Crown Point for 29 years, he and Catherine were close friends for over 60 years. All of us at Crown Point admired him greatly and we will miss him. He died on September 24th at the age of 88. This beautiful building that we're in was built in 1922. The steel case windows, the brick, and the outside cement columns were all typical buildings at that time. It was originally a newspaper holding company for an early San Francisco paper. It became ours after the 1989 earthquake, which took our previous space. And it has the right bones for our needs with beautiful Funakoshi, hand painted etching by Ron Hunt, this Anish Kapoor etching was called Untitled Jewel, was completed in 1991, he made 23 etchings here and two woodcuts over his time. In this particular image, he wanted to uh, find a way to get loosely painted surface that would resemble a watercolor. So the printer has suggested spit by aqua tint, which is something that Crown Point is known for. The artist, uh, the printer has uh, prepared a plate covered with rosin and then mixed up a bowl of nitric acid, gum arabic, and water. The artist painted this liquid on the surface, letting to create density. He let the acid pool in certain areas and then allowed it to thinly spill out in a veil next to the thicker images. Kapoor has a strong affinity for spit bite aquatint. He has said that he liked the movement between something very precise and something very fluid. To my left here is a print by the New York sculptor Judy Pfaff. Judy is known for her huge walls, I mean, room size installations of all kinds of material combined in a wonderfully layered and chaotic, but somehow orderly way. This print is called Half a Dozen of the Other, Agni Kosa, Sofa Agni Kosa. She was looking at a book um, of musings on natural phenomena by Leonardo da Vinci when she came up with this image. And it was also influenced by those installations of hers at that time in the early 90s. So she would have glass balls, all kinds of wire mesh, baskets, all kinds of materials in her installations. And in the print, she was trying to achieve the same thing. So she used to make these spirals of French drafting tool. So she combined these very fine lines with spit bite aquatint and also sugar lift aquatint. She then cut out some stencils right here and layered metallic inks on top of the plate. She purposely printed this kind of heavy inked areas of the whole composition onto a very thin Japanese paper because she liked the idea of it acting as a foil to the image. Now we're going to head over to the Alice and Shots prints. This is our, our most recent release here at Crown Point. Allison is a New York sculptor who has spent a career investigating the universe, the forces of nature, and the shape of space. Her curiosity ranges from the DNA molecule to dark matter. Her first project at Crown Point Press was in 2014, where she explored ideas about folding. She created, again, a similar series of four prints and then a small colorful portfolio. She, she visited us this past November to create the series of four etchings about knot theory. Her interest in knots started in 2003 when she was investigating the shape of space itself. 
In her readings about topography, which is a study of geometric properties and spatial relationships, she was introduced to mathematical knots. The mathematical knot differs from everyday knots in that the ends are joined together so that they cannot be undone. Looking at tangled balls of wire in her studio, she was inspired by this complex form. Her first step was to make models of tangled wire on the computer in 3D. From these models, sculptures were made, and then using a computer program, she flattened the 3D shapes to make the knotted images for these prints. This print that we're looking at right now is the print that's going to be demonstrated in the back. Courtney Sinish was the lead printer on the project, and she's going to be able to answer a lot of questions about how Allison got this surface and also got this image onto the plates. So now I'm going to head through the space to the showrooms and have a quick look in there. Stopping at the Joan Jonas of 1982. She's a performance artist, but often used sculpture in her performances. I mentioned the woodblock program that we had in both Japan and China. So I've just pulled out a couple of examples. This is a print by Pat Steer. And you can see that the print, it's watercolor based inks, so it's printed on a piece of silk which is then mounted to the larger sheet of etching paper. In this case, Pat took all these prints back to her studio after they were printed in China and hand colored areas like this dashes up there. This is a, a woodcut by David Sally from 1987. So again, watercolor based inks, typical image of his layered, slightly menacing. And then down here, this is the um, prints I mentioned that uh, Allison completed in 2014. You can see the folding. And of course, Richard Diebenkorn's pretty famous High Green Version 1. He was a very instrumental artist in the whole history of Crown Point. This was the last print that he completed in 1992. We have also uh, done a lot of photography over the years. This is a print by Darren Almond. In 1991, we wanted to do a project with Christian Boltanski, so we taught ourselves how to do photography, and we have been working with that medium ever since. This is a print by Pat Steer. You can see the scale can be quite large. So now we're just gonna head on back to the studio after Sasha shows you the other side. This is the area that our registrar, Mary Andrews, usually works in. She's preparing some working proofs that will be going to the two archives that I mentioned at the National Gallery of Fine Arts Museums. And behind us is a four panel print by Robert Colescott. <clears throat> in this print, he used every medium, soft brown, spit by aquatint, sugar lift to create a somewhat autobiographical image called Pontra Train. This is from 1997, the same year that he was the first African-American artist to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale with a solo exhibition. Our lunch rooms over here, as well as our copper plate cutter. Everything blends together here. Across the way is the drying racks, dryer over there. Plate cutter and paper storage is over here. Hi. Well, now we're going to meet Courtney Senich. Right here. 
Hi, everyone. Hi, Courtney. Intern at Crown Point Press while studying printmaking at RISD. She received a BFA in 2013. She moved to San Francisco to finish a master's degree at the California College of Art in 2015 and began working as a full time printer at Crown Point. She became a master printer in 2018. She has led projects by Darren Allman. John Kiara, Gay Outlaw, Patricia Tribe, and of course, Allison Schatz. And she's going to take over from here, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Right. Hey, welcome to the studio. So we'll begin the tour over here in the Aquatin room. So the Aquatin process is the key process to get tone and etching. So to start that process, we have a clean copper plate. So you can see it's smooth and shiny on the surface. In order for the ink to hold in the printing process, we actually have to etch a physical texture or tooth into the surface of the plate to then hold the ink in the print. So to start that, we begin over here with rosin. This is what that looks like. So this is then ground using a mortar and pestle and a coffee grinder to create a fine powder. So once it's a powder, we go over here to the aquatint box. So this is our 12 foot tall Aquatin box. It was designed and created at Crown Point Press. So let me show you how it works. Open it up. So there's a fan in the bottom. And so what we do is we put the powder into the box. The fan will get turned on and blow that powder up into the top. It creates a dust cloud in the top. And then the copper plate is placed on this fixed rack in the box. So the powder then can fall and kind of evenly coat the plate. And once it's about 50% covered, we'll take it out of the box and then put it into our Aquatint oven over here. So the oven evenly heats the plate. So that actually melts that rosin powder and that melting adheres the rosin to the copper as an acid resistant kind of dot pattern. So the acid can bite around it and then create that tooth that we were talking about to hold the ink. So the aquatint process can get combined with a lot of other processes like sugar lift or soap ground to create a variety of marks, such as brush strokes, things like that. If you wanna know more about that, we have our aquatint book here. It's full of a lot of information and troubleshooting for you in your studio to do both the Aquatint process and all of those other grounds to manipulate it. So we also have information on the Magical Secrets website, and there you can find the design for our box and a lot of our studio equipment. So next, we'll go over into the acid room. So this is the acid room where all of the etching happens. So this is our acid bath. So we use Dutch mordant here. And so normally when we're etching, we put it into this tray and then you can submerge the copper plate into the bath of acid. The acid eats away the metal and creates that tooth to hold the ink. So the longer the plate is in the acid, the deeper the acid will etch into the copper and the more ink it will hold. So here's an example of what that can look like. So here's a short amount of time in the acid at the top, about 15 seconds, up to 50 minutes. So you can really see the variety of tone you can achieve with the acid bath etching. This over here is the spit bite. That's what Valerie was describing in the gallery. So that's actually physically painting with the acid on the plate. You get a totally different effect, more like a watercolor. So the last thing we'll look at in the acid room is over here. It's our steel facing tank. So how this works is it electroplates an iron surface over the copper. So this is done when we're completely done etching. And so the reason we want to do that is the iron layer actually holds the integrity of the etch through the entire additioning process. And then it also stops the ink from oxidizing. So that's how we can get such vibrant and dynamic colors in all of our etchings. So um, I'll see you over by the printing press in a few minutes. Meanwhile, Valerie's waiting over in the studio.
Hi, welcome back. This is our history corner. Um, Catherine Brown, the founder of Palfrey Press. In 1959, she was studying at a college in Ohio that allowed for you to go to another college overseas and still um, get credit for the work that you did there. Catherine was an actually an English major. And she uh, told her art professor that she wanted to go to London. So he suggested that she go to the Central School of Arts and Crafts there to take an art class. And she said, well, I'm not an artist. He said, you should be. So she went to school over there in London and studied art and became in love with etching, her first time exposed to that medium. So she went back for a second year. And after the second year, she went to a little vacation to Scotland to celebrate her degree, and she found this edging press laying in the backyard of the boarding house where she was staying in. She recognized that it was an edging press, and she said to the landlady, I know what that is. And she, the landlady said, well, if you can take that off my hands, you can have it. So Catherine traded in her plane ticket. She found a freighter going from Glasgow to San Francisco, and it took two months for the two of them to get here. She set up a studio over in Richmond, which is in the East Bay, and she started inviting friends of hers that were artists to make uh, prints, like in a workshop. It's the first idea of a workshop. So this uh, book is her memoir, which contains the really great, rich history of Crown Point Press. So now we're gonna head over to watch Courtney. So I'm about to demonstrate how to print this image from Allison Schatz. It's a four plate print with three colored aquatint plates and a chincolé plate with white gompi. So you can see in the bottom, she signed it OKTP. So here at Crown Point, we sign the prints OKTP when the artist has finished all of the plate work and the ink work in the studio. So that means OK to print. So then this print is with us in the studio the entire time we're additioning and color proofing so that we match the final prints to this print that Allison signed. So let me start with the chinclay process. So for this image, Allison chose a white gompi paper to use as chinclay. So that's this thin tissue. It's made from the bark of a gompi tree and it's handmade in Japan. So it's really thin. One of the reasons we like to use gompi is because it has a very strong fine fiber. So you can actually really soak it and it's not gonna fall apart or lose its integrity. So I completely soaked that. I soaked the plate. So carefully pick up the sheet. You can see that it has stayed very strong and in place. So this will go over here. Plate. The water that I applied um, helps it to be able to move around. If you were to get any sort of air bubble, you can easily shift it and lift it up to release that. Whereas if it was drier, it would be more difficult. So the next step is to paste it. So we use Jinshofu paste, which is a wheat starch. It's cooked with water to create this kind of gel-like consistency. And then it is thinned out and brushed on. So I'm brushing center out to make sure that the gompi stays smooth on the plate. This paste is water soluble and archival. That's why we like to use it. So after I've covered the plate, I'll go kind of smooth it out, make sure there's no inconsistencies in the paste surface.
If the paste is too thick, you'll see um, those brush strokes in the ink in the final image. So just going around the edge, make sure it's well glued. So the reason I have a little overhang here is we always cut the gompi bigger than the plate so that we can trim the gompi to the exact plate size. So it'll line up with the inked plates in the image. So to trim the edges, I have a clean razor blade and I'm just trimming along that edge. A bit of advice for this is to well sand the edge of the plate. So I use a fine you know, jeweler sandpaper along the edge to get a nice smooth edge so that the razor doesn't catch. If the razor catches, you might get a little bit of fiber hanging off and you risk that clinging to the plate in the printing process. Allison, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, we had a question about the wheat paste. How do you know the, the ratio of wheat paste to water? And is it a, a, a thick wheat paste to paint? Um, so the cooking process is, um, Hiromi recommends four parts water to one part starch. So we just do that uh, quantity. I think that works really well for us and what we're doing. You may want a little more starch if you're using a thicker paper that needs, you know, more glue, but not more than like three parts water to one part starch. So we just use a measuring cup to measure that out when we cook it. And then once it's that gel, we strain it through a cloth or like a mesh kind of metal strainer to kind of break it back up and that will help it incorporate into the water to thin out to brush on. So it's kind of like, I don't know, a uh, yogurt kind of consistency when it goes on, I would say. But if you're using a thinner paper, you might want the glue thinner. So I have it pretty thin. Um, if you're using a thicker Kozo or something even thicker, you might want to thin it a little bit less. You can see the how thick it is in this tray before I dilute it. That's perfect, so, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> more information about that can actually be found. We have a Chinkale book and that really goes into detail about using different types of paper, maybe cutting gompi pieces or, you know, different, different chinclay pieces to adhere. So you can find a ton of information in that book. So the next part is to ink a plate. So here is one of Allison's plates. You can see now that steel facing on the surface. It's, it gives it that silver color. So to card the ink on, I have this plastic yellow inking card. So because it's plastic, it won't scratch the plate. So I have a ribbon of ink and I evenly go across the plate. You can see it going on pretty thick over the etched area. When I get to the edge, I go at a slight angle so that the ink stays on the plate and doesn't drip off the edge. It's a little trick. So then I'll turn the plate to finish this side, trying to keep our working surface as clean as possible. So this inking stand is slightly heated with a heating element. It's just barely warm to the touch. That just helps the ink kind of move around a little bit easier and the, helps the wiping go a little bit faster. But it's not too hot that we pull ink out. So this is a tarlatan. It's a starch cheesecloth. It has a weave pattern to it. So what that does is it pushes the ink into the etched areas and pulls the ink off the surface of the plate. So the shiny surface, we don't want any ink left on that when we're done wiping. 
that will be a clean area and the ink should hold only where we've etched into the plate. So I go in a circular motion to help pick up that ink. You can kind of see now the line elements revealing itself. So that's that etched area I was talking about. <clears throat> So I'm moving just to a clean area of the tarlatan here. We have a question about um, why one would choose Sheen Calais uh, as opposed to just printing directly without the additional layer of fine paper. Oh, um, that's uh, the artist's decision. So that's part of the image. Uh, we do not use Sheen Calais on all of our images. It's purely if the artist wants it. Allison Schatz really liked that shiny, smooth surface that the Gompi gave. She also, um, in the four images, she used different colored Gompis. So you might have like a blue ink color going over a warm, what like a warm natural Gompi color, and it'll create a, a green color when they combine that you can't achieve through just inking. So there's an interesting um, quality that she liked about it and chose for this set of images. We had a very specific question about the gompi. Was the towel under the gompi wet? And did you put the gompi down on the plate wet side up or wet side down? Oh, um, so the towel was not wet. Um, that was just laid there so that it gave a flat surface for the gompi to be dampened onto and wouldn't like saturate something underneath. If the surface underneath was saturated, the gompi might kind of cling to it or unevenly dampen. Um, you can use any type of towel or you can just hold the gompi and have someone spray it. Um, and yeah, what was, oh, so, the Gompi has a front side that's a little bit shinier than the back side. And so I sprayed the front side of it, that shiny side, um, and then put that shiny side down on the plate. Um, you can spray either side. I just prefer to do that because then that main thick moisture layer on the Gompi is meeting the moisture on the plate that it's going on to. It makes it a little easier for me to move it around, but the gompi is so thin that the moisture soaks into the whole sheet, front and back, no matter what side you spray it on. <laughs> but sometimes when you spray it, you kind of can't figure out what the front is anymore because they look the same. So I just try to keep consistent. So everything is the same. So what I'm doing now is a process that Catherine brought back from her studies in London. It's the French method of wiping. So when she was studying in the United States, their wiping method was a little more expressive where they might leave tone on the plate or extra ink. So what Catherine liked about this method is that you really wipe the plate clean and consistent. And so any information you want should be etched into the plate. And then that also helps for training printers because once you're trained in this wiping style, any one of us can pick up these plates and wipe them and ink them and they should look exactly the same. That also um, helps with consistency and quality throughout the editioning process. So I find with personally with the hand wiping that you can really feel the ink and how it's moving on the plate. So you know when the surface is wiped clean so that you're not over wiping and pulling ink out of the grooves. And you can really just kind of get a tactile sense of what's happening. So you can really see now those etched areas standing out. Um, the ink color is pretty dark, so that helps. So I'm just looking for uh, that ink film to kind of disappear and to just see that shiny silver color pretty clean on the plate. So I'm using this palm area, the side palm area of my hand. I'm 
All right, so then I'll kind of look at the plate, breaking angle, see if I see any little bit of tone left. I don't want it to be. One of our viewers is wondering if you're using talc when wiping. Uh, yeah, I have a little um, whiting or chalk down here below the inking stand. I just put a tiny bit on my hand, so it goes kind of like this. And then I actually wipe it off with the rag because I don't want the chalk to fall onto the plate. The chalk will um, stick to the ink and dry it out and it won't really print properly. So um, it's important to actually wipe it out your hand so you don't have loose chalk, but the chalk helps to pick up the ink a little bit faster and wipe it off the plate. So now I'm just getting the edges. And I just go along the edges. These edges are filed pretty clean. We don't want any um, ink to hold on those edges and show up in the print. So it's final touch. All right, so because it's a three plate image, I've already inked the other two plates that go with this print. This is the background. And here is the light blue kind of inner line information. So we'll go over here and I will print it on the press. I normally wash my hands at this stage, but I'll wear gloves. So I've cleaned the press off, so that's ready to go. And over here is our paper. So we keep the paper wrapped in plastic. I soaked it in the morning in a water bath. So it's a Somerset cotton rag paper. So it can really be dumped in water. And so when it's wrapped in plastic and it sits in the plastic, the water evenly saturates the sheet. So you get a really nice um, even impression in the printing. So wipe that surface water off because we don't want any pooling water. Uh, pick it up. So I put the front of the paper down on the press. So we have a few like little tape marks on the press that kind of notates roughly where the paper should go. So I'm just lining it up. We always print on oversized paper so that the margins can be torn down after it's flattened and dried so that all the margins are exactly the same size. All that moisture now, kind of wiped off the surface. So I'm gonna crank the press and this is called trapping the paper in the press. So I just rolled over that maybe inch of edge. This is another reason to have um, a larger sheet of paper. So it's stuck in place and I'm gonna put it over the roller. So now that's secured. So for our registration, we use a registration jig. So we make these here and um, how it works is it's an L-shaped piece of copper and we have a fixed piece of copper here on the press bed. So this is just taped on. So this could actually be used on any size press, which is nice. So this piece fits just into that fixed piece we have this piece of copper that is called a pre-stretch plate. So essentially what it does is it takes the initial stretch out of the paper because it's wet, it stretches a lot in the first pass or two. So put this down, fits into the jig, and then the jig is picked up and the plate floats in the center of the press. The press. So this plate is also a touch smaller than the final plate because the paper stretches that plate mark will 
expand out and then meet the other plate marks on the following plate. So you can really see now the amount of pressure that's put on this plate where you see the embossment appear. So I've been careful to keep the paper trapped in the press. So that um, keeps the paper in the exact same place. So I don't have to worry about it moving. Now I'll go back through. You can do this one or two times. We do it twice because we always start printing on the same side of the press. And this image has an even number of plates. We had a question about a uh, color separation plate. Um, when you're making a um, color separation plate, what is your particular method or technique for making sure that the image is uh, aligned in the same way on each? Oh, okay. Uh, so that is register in place. Um, so we use registration today, same one, and what we'll do is shim the plates. So other presses um, that don't use this might mark on the press bed um, and make notes about shimming and moving plates. So what we do is we actually shim, and I'll show you that in a minute um, with the following plate. Perfect. Okay. So here is a gothy plate. So it's allowed to dry a little bit. You can see it's starting to dry over here. Um, I would say it could be this is maybe on a little bit of the wetter side. It could be a little bit drier. You'll start to see more specks of white appear. If it's too dry, it'll start to peel up off the plate. So you want to find kind of that middle ground where it's a little bit wet and a little bit dry. So it, it's so then the glue is tacky and it'll stick to the backing paper. So I'm setting this plate down, and so I have these notes. And I know that um, I want to shim out the gompy plate. So what I'm gonna do is we use these different size razor blades. And so I put this one here, this one here. And then I will push into the corner. And this razor will go here pushed into place. And then these are carefully lifted out. So that is that kind of registration manipulation that using these tools, you know the exact distance that they're gonna go and it'll keep your consistency in registration. So I'll just double check how this stayed in place. This is pulled off. <clears throat> So when artists work here at Crown Point, they're here for two weeks in the studio, working with master printers. And so us printers are here to just facilitate the project and do all the technical kind of aspects to assist them in making their work. So they make all of the decisions and make all the calls and sometimes you know, are drawing and etching the plates themselves and we're just helping them you know, work through the technical side so they can achieve exactly what they want. When Allison was here, she was working on a sculpture at the same time in her own studio that had a 3D rendering on her computer. So she really wanted to find a way to get kind of a digital feel of a line onto the plate so that she could really think about her sculpture while she was here making prints. So we were like, okay, how can we do that? <laughs> and um, came to the idea of actually thinking about uh, creating a resist, an acid resist from a digital file. So we actually ended up printing a digital image with acrylic onto the plate and then etching around it. So this kind of shiny linear area is based off of her digital sculpture file. 
and then we etched around it to create that tone. So this is the background plate. Uh, the background plate is just a flat aqua tint, so that um, that plate was had that resist on it and was put into the acid bath, so it was etched evenly. And then Allison saw the print as she was working on the different plates, and it's like, how can we make the background like feel like it's glowing in the center? And so I talked to her about her idea and her vision and what she kind of wanted to achieve. And so what she ended up doing was sanding the aqua tint in the center. So that tooth that I was describing that holds the ink is a little shallower in the center. So it doesn't hold as much and gives that nice kind of gradient fade to the background. So it's really important to ink all of your plates and etching in advance. As you can see, I'm catching the paper and keeping it in place. Since this paper is wet, uh, you don't want it to dry out. So you really have to have everything ready in advance, which is different than some of the other print processes where you print a layer and let it dry. So doing this um, all at the same time, make sure that your registration and ink will be very consistent from print to print. Question about your method for setting the pressure. Oh, okay. Oh, so my method. <laughs> we kind of, uh, because we always use the same thickness of copper plate, uh, we don't, we have kind of a range. When we use gompies, we lighten the pressure because the gompie adds some thickness to it. So uh, basically, to kind of test that, like if you change your blankets or something, we might run a blank copper plate through and just feel what it feels like to turn the press and also pay attention to the embossment into the paper. If the pressure is too heavy, your embossment is gonna give like a crackling kind of look at the edge where the paper might be tearing or splitting. So that kind of means that your pressure is too high. And if your pressure is too low, you're probably gonna get not a nice even inking kind of impression. You'll see kind of a kind of um, weaker points and your aqua tint might not be even and you won't get much of a plate embossment. So now you can really see how that registration is working. Um, shimming the plates, the plate edges are lining up, the embossments aren't sticking out. And we're always printing with the bottom of the plate in the same location. We never turn the plates around, do anything different. They're always printed in the same order so that the colors appear the same on the final print. So shim this one out a little bit differently. This shimming process is worked out after the artist leaves the studio. Um, in the trial proofing, we really make sure that everything's perfect um, and keep notes. So again, lift the jig. If I were to run the press through with the jig down, you'd get a nice little embossment on your margin <laughs> of that plate. So there, going through. I keep the paper back on the roller because I find that it just gives me a little bit more um, assurance that there won't be a wrinkle and that the registration will stay the same, uh, keeps the paper taut so it doesn't kind of gap or do anything unusual that could affect the registration. So here we go, it's the final reveal. 
So all three inked layers are printed on that gompi, and that gompi is now glued to the back end sheet. So the next step would be to put this print in the print dryer and the print dryer will dry it flat and then margins are torn down to the sizes that Allison chose while she was here in the studio. And then they're all looked over to make sure that everything lined up perfectly and the colors match the okay and then they're sent to her to sign. Thank you. So any more questions? So many questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> early on, one of our viewers wanted to know what you're doing to celebrate uh, Wayne's 100th birthday. Will there be a, a party or, or some other recognition? Well, um, unfortunately, in this time, it's kind of hard to have a big, the small exhibition that we put up in the lobby and for your area is kind of a, a, a little bit of a celebration. We had another show of Wayne's Prince that was a bit bigger this past summer. Um, but there are many things going on. The Crocker Museum has shown Wayne's work since the 50s as having a big show. And the Shrim Museum in Davis, where he used to teach, is going to have a big show in January. So, uh, you know, basically, we just keep going with Wayne. Uh, many questions, um, as, as I expected, many questions about um, how you choose the artists that you work with. Um, how do these relationships develop? Um, how might an emerging artist, um, you know, be, begin their career and someday have that wish fulfillment of producing an edition with you? And also, um, uh, maybe a little bit more about the career path to become a, a master printer. Okay, and that's kind of a two-part question. So I'll let Courtney answer the question about the career path. Um, choosing artists is always a very subjective experience. I'll just say that right now. Um, we only do four projects a year and almost three quarters of those projects are done with artists that we've been working with and developing over the years. And then we occasionally invite a new artist to come here. We just don't have a program large enough to accommodate more artists we wish that we did. Having the summer workshops is a partial way of expanding our educational interest in our community. You know, letting artists, anybody, there's no portfolio review, anything, just first come, first serve, come and find out if etching is for you. And then just like any other artist developing their career, you just keep working in the community. Uh, but we don't, you know, look at slides or portfolios. It's it's really kind of about artists that we've worked with for a very long time, might suggest somebody we'll take a look at. And I think that within the art, art world, uh, you would list here as an example. Like when we first decided to work with Laura Owens, she suggested Chris O'Feely and Peter Doig. So that kind of thing happens all the time, where artists that you know really well suggest somebody within their milieu to, to invite. So I hope I've answered the question. It's not that, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, and so as for the path to master printer, uh, so my path started with studying etching. That's not totally necessary. It's really just an inner desire to kind of do the process and really learn it. I highly recommend um, just applying for internships and kind of getting into different presses, studying. Um, for me, I when I was in school, <laughs> I you know, wrote Crown Point. I was like, do you have any internship possibilities? I found through my studies that I'm really interested in etching specifically. And so I was able to come here for an internship. And then I interned at a few other presses as well before coming here full time as a printer. So um, one of our old master printers studied painting, but found a love of etching and got internships. and found his way into that path as well. So there's different ways, just, you know, if you're dedicated, you'll find a way, I think. That's perfect, thank you. Well, it is uh, 11.57 Central Time, um, so we have just a couple of more minutes. Um, Valerie, if there's anything else that you wanna share about any 
upcoming projects. There are many very technical questions about blankets and plates, which I'm going to pass on now. Um, but I think that we've covered, um, we've covered a lot. So yeah. I would, I think this is a good place to wrap up. And well, I, go ahead. Great. I'm just going to thank you for coming. We have um, a very good email um, program. If you want to sign up and hear about things that we do, you can certainly do that online and get involved. And uh, we're always open. When the world opens up in a bigger way, we do these tours live. So if you're ever in San Francisco, we really do invite you to come. We are open right now by appointment. Um, we have changing exhibitions every six weeks and they're usually organized to highlight a brand new project. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Courtney. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.